I like Spurgeon. You know, not just because the book is bound and really feels good in my hands, but he always brings us to a recognition and a realization of something that we may take for granted, but we forget, and we go off on tangents at times and don't recognize the importance of what he's saying, because sometimes his King James and his Elizabethan English takes us far away from the point that he's driving because he's so eloquent and his elocution is so illicit in, in its expertise. How's that for ease? But one of the things that I enjoy, you know, or one of the things that people have brought to my attention at times is that in the ministry that I have, I have such a wide variety of writings and postings and uh, videos and, and uh, <laughs> now I have to think about it all, um, blogs, websites, that, and networks that, you know, they will ask me questions sometimes that I'll say, well, just Google my name, you know, it's easier because then you can find everything, you know, from Google and you can look it up, which to me, I would have done that anyways with other people. That's what I do is I check the information out. Well, sometimes people have written back and said, well, that's pretty prideful. And I, I went, <laughs> wait a minute, obviously you don't know me because if you ever watch one of my videos, you know that one of the most important things that I try to emphasize and stress is that the recognition that in me there dwelleth no good thing but in me also is dwelling and changing within me the Spirit of God, is that He is alive and well and living and choosing to operate through me by speaking the words that I might not have thought of to say, that He would choose to bring forth to a person that might cause them to understand that it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me, because I literally had been down to 89 pounds and dying and, and nothing and devastated and no life left within this flesh itself and then doctors were shocked and amazed that somehow some way he lived past 30 and to this day it still amazes some of them and I know that when I operate when I move when I share when I care when I do the things that work within God's will then he is able to bless people with it and use it in some way and I know that when I'm not with God that it's obvious what I am because shoot you give me five minutes alone without the Spirit of God and guess what I'm just like a pig in a wallow and I'll get just as dirty as the rest of you but the point being is that there can be no glory given except that we give glory to God for which he has done in us as he works through us to accomplish his purpose with us because it's never amount of what you have become you don't become suddenly this Johnny on the spot that you're perfect now in all your ways and everything you say happens the way that you said it. No, it is always you are the feeble, weak one that God is using to accomplish his purpose because if if God could have used a jackass, he could use you. And to put it bluntly, that's the perspective that Spurgeon always said to take when it came to ministers of God in eliciting or somehow taking credit for something that God has done as opposed to what God is doing in you. So don't get too carried away about, you know, thinking that you are the one or that you're somebody special because you're not. Neither am I. <laughs> you know, five minutes with my wife will let you know I'm nobody special. But what makes us unique, distinctive, and the realization is that we are a tabernacle of God, that God has put these dead skins on the outside to contain what's inside, which is himself and his glory, that he will reveal through us as it shines forth and demonstrates itself in the actions, the words, and the very lives that we live. So it's not really us, even as Paul said, because Paul said, I know that, hey, in me there dwelleth of no good thing, and not only that, but that, you know, he prayed he become worthy to be spared of all these things that were coming upon the world as well as to not be cast off. And if Paul was so concerned that he wanted to work out his salvation with fear and trembling, then likewise we too know what we are without mercy, without forgiveness, without grace. We know just how corrupt we really are. But God has changed us from glory to glory into the image of his Son, and as he has, it is for his accomplishment 
that he can say he, not us, his work, not ours, but he is the author and finisher of our faith. The works of salvation that he has done are accomplished in us by what he brings us to become as he reveals and concerns our lives with becoming likened unto his son, created into the image of his son, changed into his glory from day by day living with and experiencing God in a personal way as Jesus did when he said I see the Father and I do only those things that are pleasing to him I talked to the Father and the Father talked with me and he prayed that they would be one even as his Father and him were one isn't that what you want to do isn't that what you do with your wife with your friends with your neighbors with your fellowship with your church with your religion isn't that really what it's all about is to become and to know God in that personal way, to become one with Him today. In Spurgeon, give unto the Lord the glory due His name. God's glory is the result of His nature and His acts. He is glorious in His character, for there is such a store of everything that is holy and good and lovely in God that He must be glorious. He has to be. That's who he is. The actions which flow from his character are also glorious. Everything he does is mighty. But while he intends that they should be manifest or obvious to his creatures, his goodness and mercy and justice, he is equally concerned that the glory of who he is and what he is associated with him should be given only to himself and not taken by any other. Nor is there aught in ourselves in which we may glory, for we know what we are made out of. Dust we are, and dust we shall return. For who maketh us to differ from another? And what have we that we did not receive from God of all grace? Then how careful ought we to be to walk humbly before the Lord? The moment we glorify ourselves, since there is room for only one glory, only in the universe, we set ourselves up as rivals to the Most High God. Shall the insect of an hour glorify itself against the sun which warmed it into life? Shall the potsherd, <laughs> the potsherd, boy, there's an old English word. Shall the potsherd exalt itself above the man who fashioned it upon the wheel? Shall the dust of the desert strive with the whirlwind, or the drops of the ocean struggle with the tempest? Give unto the Lord all ye righteous, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto him the honor that is due unto his name. Yet it is, perhaps, one of the hardest struggles of the Christian life to learn this sentence. Not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name be glory. It is a lesson which God is ever teaching us, ever explaining and ever revealing to us, and teaching us sometimes by most painful discipline. Let a Christian begin to boast, I can do all things, without adding, through Christ which strengthens me, and before long he will have to groan, I can do nothing, and bemoan himself in the dust. When we do anything for the Lord, and he is pleased to accept of our doings, let us lay our crown at his feet and exclaim, Not I, but the grace of God which was in me. There is in popular fundamentalist Christianity, and in the Christian world at large, in both religion and non-denomination, this idea of possession of authority that they can go out and do what they want without really seeking God to tell them to do it in the first place. And in a lot of ways, that's the tragedy because when the day come, if it come to them, which God only knows whether it be for them or for us or for who, that the Lord says, I don't know you, even though you prophesied in my name and you've done all these marvelous works in my name. The question isn't about what authority we have or what glory we took, but whether we knew Jesus and whether we walked with him daily to know what he has told us to do today. You see, today is the day to give him his glory in being a living God by what you do and obey in what he says to you today. It's always about today, not tomorrow. And it's not about your past, but it's about your present so that you can have a future. Because today, Jesus is speaking to you, and he wants you to hear his voice so you can do what he says today.